The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 27. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. We stand for the reading of the gospel. From the first chapter of Mark. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they, took him, they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. 
And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for Jesus. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated at this time. We'll invite our DCE up, Director of Christian Education, as you learn that word, DCE, and then all the kids come forward for a children's message. Good morning. You can sit wherever you want. Oh, come a little closer. Come on. Yep, come on. A little closer. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am going to need a helper this morning. Is there anyone who wants to be my helper? All right, I saw your hand first. I want you to hold this big red heart for me. Can you stand up and hold the big red heart? Can everyone see it? The big red heart? Okay, well, what holiday is coming up that has a lot of big red hearts? Valentine's Day, that's right. It's in about a week and a half. Can you believe it? That's so soon. Whenever you look at hearts, what do you think of? Love, yes. Sometimes people will text to their friends and say, I heart you, or, you know, put like hearts in their eyeballs and stuff like that. When we look at hearts, we think of loving somebody, something. Maybe you love video games or you love your puppy dog. We love a whole lot of things. Well, we know Jesus loves us and our mom and dads love us, right? But sometimes we might get a little angry at them. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten angry at your brother or sister. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever been sad when one of your friends has maybe called you a name or said something mean to you. Yeah, it happens to all of us, and those little things break our heart. So now I want you to hold this broken heart that I have here. And I'll take the other one from you. Thank you. So this is our very sad, broken heart. And when our hearts are broken, it doesn't mean that we run out of love, but it means that instead of focusing on God's awesome, glorious love, we start thinking about the sad things and the things that made us mad or angry or the things that get us really annoyed and frustrated. So what happens when you have a cut or a scrape on your arm? What can you put on it to make it feel better? A Band-Aid, yes. And here's my last heart here. And it's a heart that was broken, but there are Band-Aids on it that help put it back together, and the Band-Aids have the name of Jesus on it because Jesus acts like our Band-Aid. He is so cool and so powerful and so loving that his love can fix any of our broken hearts. That's what the Bible says. It says Jesus heals our broken hearts because his love is so awesome, there's nothing he can't fix with it. Pretty cool, right? All right, thank you for being my helper. Let's fold our hands and bow our heads. You can come and sit over here if you want. And repeat after me. We're going to pray to Jesus. Ready? Dear Jesus... Thank you for healing my broken heart and for loving me so much. I love you. Amen. Thanks, everyone. You can go back to your seats now. <laughs> you know, Velcro has its advantages and disadvantages. So. Since we love Isaiah's prophecy about mounting up on wings like eagles, I want to start with that, and then I'm going to preach on the gospel lesson today. But I want to start in verse 28 where it says, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He does not faint or grow weary. So recently I was sitting in my lazy boy at the end of the day and the phone rang and it wasn't a text. Those don't alarm me. But when the phone rings in the night, 
Do you ever kind of feel like it's like an ambulance driving by your house and you hope whoever it is that needs that is going to be okay? But when the phone rings and it's your phone, it's like the ambulance crashes into your heart, right? And I look down and it says, Mom. Mom doesn't call me, right? I call Mom. That's my job as a son. So I slide, answer the phone, and she says, Oh, David, my Uncle Arlie had a heart attack and pneumonia and was hospitalized, um, and it was breaking my mom's heart. She had four older brothers, and Arlie's the closest one to her. And, and Arlie happens to be uh, my, he's also my godfather. So on the day that I was washed clean of my sins, I pooped on Uncle Arlie's shirt. I had a leaky diaper. So I went home clean, and he went home dirty. So we've always had that kind of connection. And to hear that my mom was concerned, they say it's really, really, really bad. And it uh, doesn't look good. And so that's how she just needed comfort, you know, and, and so we just did that. And I remember telling my mom, I said, you know, one of the great memories of Uncle Arlie is sitting in the choir because my mom was the organist. And so she made us sit in the choir and Uncle Arlie singing, uh, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, you know, that Just As I Am song. And he kind of had a raspy voice, a unique voice, you know, if he ever went professional, he'd, have, he'd had a memorable kind of raspy kind of sound voice. So I, I thought about that. That's always a memory that comes to my mind. But I'm going to tell you one other thing about that hospital, what was going on in the hospital with Arlie. Um, just so you know, he, he's kind of subdued and everything as they're trying to figure out how damaged maybe the heart and other things are. But I'll come back to that. It makes me, when I, when I have those experiences, when you and I have those experiences and we see Jesus in Capernaum, right? And people are showing up out of nowhere to Jesus and he's just healing people, lifting up Peter's mother-in-law by the hand and doing those kind of things. When we see that, we long for that kind of experience. And sometimes reading the Bible, you might even feel like, well, I wish I lived back then because then I would have known what to do or, or where to go when my loved one is ill. And I'm going to help you kind of sort through that a little bit as I have myself. But first, let's just look at the story. Last week, Jesus has muzzled the demon He's been the astonishing and authoritative teacher. And immediately after the synagogue, who knows how long that lasted, um, Jesus goes to the house he's staying at. He's staying with Simon and Andrew in their home. And apparently Simon's uh, mother-in-law is there. So there's lots of people living in this house. So Jesus leaves the synagogue and he goes to that house. You know what I'm thinking as a pastor? What do you do after church? You know what this is? That's my lazy boy in action, right? So Jesus is going after church. He's taught, muzzled the demon. He's going to take a nap. Matter of fact, if you look on Facebook, pastors oftentimes post about their naps, right? That they take on Sunday afternoons. They feel exhausted. They take their naps. And so um, I take them every day. No, I'm just kidding. Sort of. But, uh, but Jesus doesn't take a nap because no sooner did he walk in the house, what did what did Peter tell him? Hey, my mom, there's a flu going along around in Capernaum. And my mother-in-law, who normally would be taking care of all of our needs, she's a great person of hospitality and welcome. She's laid out on bed. And um, Jesus goes, and the Bible, I love how Mark gives us details. Jesus just grabbed that woman by the hand. Her hands were probably hot or clammy or whatever from the fever. And he just lifted her up. And Mark says the fever took off. The fever left her. And she began to serve them. You know what that makes me think about? The lazy boy again. So now Jesus is going to get a break. So he can sit down. Peter's mother-in-law is going to do the serving, some hospitality. No doubt Jesus did get a little break in there and a little refreshment as she served them. But Jesus always on active duty. But the Bible said as that day progressed and Jesus' fame spread... And by the way, anyone going this way, that way, and that way on the road was, set, was telling what was happening in Capernaum about Jesus. And that resonated with people whose loved ones were in trouble, who had a demon, who were ill in any different kinds of way. And the world around Capernaum began to agitate and to move. And people migrated, even though the day was almost over, as the darkness came and they started to gather in the streets outside of that house 
where Jesus was not in the lazy boy. They gathered around there. Now Mark says they had various diseases. You really need to use your imagination here. What do people who are sick sound like? <coughs> Sneezing, moaning, and pain. Now not only that, imagine they're having that kind of feeling, but others are having to carry them, or they're having to walk all the way to where Jesus is. The amount of sounds of weariness and faintness that were echoing in those streets had to have been alarming as people gathered there in hopes that Jesus would do something for them. And they gathered. And apparently Jesus either went out or saw each and every one of them, for he healed many in various diseases. It didn't matter what the diagnosis was, a, a palsied limb, a paralyzed body part, a, a flu, a bleed. And even those that had demons, as the demons, you can imagine the line of demons in the streets knowing that the body that they had pirated was now about to be liberated, convulsing, maybe even groaning as they got close to Jesus, who muzzled them and quieted them all down. Right? Imagine the sounds in the street as people went to see Jesus. Not only that, I worked one time as a medical translator in the mountains of Guatemala, and one of my jobs at the end of the day was to go out, and people were gathered. They carried their sick people. One, I remember one family carried somebody with cancer three days to see a doctor. There were no doctors in this area of the world, none. They carried him up and over mountains for three days to the place where our doctors were. And I remember they were in line at the end of the day when the doctors were all exhausted from sun up to sundown, they had been working. There was just no more they could do. And it was my job to go out and tell the people, we're not seeing any more patients today. And they camped right there in the streets outside the clinic. Right? Even the caregivers were exhausted and weary. Jesus knows what it's like to live in this valley of sorrow. Health isn't the norm. It's often the exception. Freedom from a devil who hunts and harasses. We're often wearied by the many temptations that harass us throughout our whole lives. No matter what, we create a bubble that makes us appear safe and happy and secure. Deep down inside, we know the bubble's about to break at any moment in time. And if we're honest, the bubble's not really a mighty fortress after all. Jesus knows that. And so caregivers and the sick, they all went to Jesus and he healed those various diseases and muzzled them all throughout the night. I don't know what time it ended, but the next time we see Jesus, it's early in the morning. Did he even sleep at all? Mark doesn't even tell us. So after everybody went to bed, it does say that Jesus arose, so it appears that maybe he got a short sleep. Jesus leaves. And where does he go? Off to a desolate place by himself. Now you and I, if we did ministry like Jesus, and I want you to know Jesus did have a, a true, he was a true man. He wasn't doing all this because he was just using his divine energy. He wore his body out for that world and for you and I. That is the body he put out. And he did not grow faint or weary, though I tell you his muscles were sore. He was worn out. He was sleep deprived. And he often felt, I'm sure, for his age and his joints, all the same things that you feel under the burden of this life. And Jesus pushed his body. So that early in the morning, Jesus gets up and walks off into a desolate place outside of town. And Mark tells us he continued to work because he prayed. Those who pray do a work. Jesus prayed. What did he pray about? I'm sure he prayed about the mission the Father had sent him on. And he said, Father, oh, the griefs and the burdens I am to bear. The things I saw on the streets of Capernaum would turn the human heart upside down. But Father, I know these streets of Capernaum are the streets of the whole world. And the brokenness that is there in this area of geography is everywhere, Father. I will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Jesus went there with a wearied body, and still wearied, he prayed. And there in the Father's presence, Jesus renewed his strength, refueled, and found the strength to carry on. And he would do this throughout his whole life, all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross itself, finding his renewed strength in prayer to his Father for the mission that he was sent on. And then the disciples show up, right? They finally found him. I don't know, what were they, trackers? They find his footprints. Probably was a place that Jesus often went to be alone and pray. They knew about where he prayed. They eventually catch up to him, and they find him, and they see him. They don't care that he's praying. They care about the waves of people that are crashing against the shores of Capernaum. Jesus, the needs since you've left have continued to roll in. Everyone is looking for you. You have to go back. Come back home, Jesus. You haven't fulfilled every need. And then Jesus says the curious thing. That's why we're going to other towns. What? What other needs are you going to fulfill? Why don't you finish one job and then we'll move on to the next and the next and the next. But obviously that's not how Jesus saw it. He said, I'm going to the other towns to preach that which you see happening. I'm going to offer to the entire world. And as Jesus would preach from town to town, these signs and wonders would point to something greater. Everyone is looking for you, but nobody would be looking there for the cross, which would be the ultimate solution. All those people in Capernaum that were healed from their sicknesses no doubt became ill again. And many of them were buried, would die and buried. All of them did die and was buried. But Jesus is saying, I am going to preach because there's something Another reality happening here that's going to come true. And Jesus said, let us go to the other towns, for that is why I have come out. So what he was telling the world is that everyone's going to get healed here. He wasn't telling the whole world that all the problems would be solved wherever Jesus was Lord. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is, you need, everyone needs to look where I'm going. To town, to town to town, and finally, to the cross. That is where we're supposed to look. That is where we're to fix our eyes. That is where we're to see the answer to the question, will I be healed? Will I be delivered? Will I stand before God restored just as they were on the streets of Capernaum? I think about Jesus on the cross after being tortured. How wearied and faint he must have been, even from the loss of blood. But look at him. His cry on the cross, it is finished, is not running out of steam. It's a triumphant and a victorious cry for Jesus. It is finished for everyone to be healed. And then early in the morning, just like the day of prayer, Jesus walks out of his tomb, having laid there in rest Almost like the days of creation, resting in the tomb, Jesus rose again. Now to have his disciples deliver the results of the most renewable strength this world has ever known. The strength of Jesus' resurrection and his pledge and promise to all those who believe in him to have everlasting life. There they would go looking for Jesus in a tomb, but he was alive again. And Jesus would tell his disciples that they would go into the world to tell the world this valley of sorrows has numbered days for the wiping of tears is coming for all who believe in me. And that would renew people's strength. And that was the good news that Jesus preached. Now go back to the hospital room with Uncle Arlie. As I talked to my mom, she calmed down. She was anxious that he would never come home. And so she said, but you want to know what happened when they finally got Uncle Arlie back alert again? He asked for something. I said, what did he ask for? He asked to sing hymns. And I said, Mom, what did he sing? It would have been cool if it was just as I am without one plea. I don't know that he didn't sing that. But he said, I want to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Right? Right? In the Bible, in the book of James, it talks about if anyone's suffering, let him pray. 
if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. What's wrong with Uncle Arlie? Isn't he suffering? Shouldn't he pray? But he is praying and singing his songs from a cheerful heart, from somebody who knows that what that song is about, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. The first thing he wants to sing, echoing in the halls of that hospital, is Christian faith. It's a cheerfulness and a prayer even in the midst of sorrow to know how the story ultimately and always ends for a people of faith in Christ Jesus. A valley of sorrow that's already defeated by triumph that is even sung by people with heart failure and pneumonia in the halls of a hospital by faith. A cheerfulness even in the midst of of all the trials and sufferings of this life. What was going on there? I believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, what John promised in his gospel is that anyone who loves Jesus, Jesus, anybody who loves me, Jesus says, and he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It is Jesus that gathers at the door of our hearts. Now, it is he who comes with us. There's no going to Capernaum to find Jesus. It's a Jesus who is with us. Who in his own way in our hearts grabs Arlie by the hand and lifts him up with a pneumonia-ridden, heart-failured voice to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. That is the healing that is occurring even while we take our final breath. The healing and the restoration that Jesus brings as he gathers with the Father in our hearts. So not just the ambulance crashing into your heart after all, is it? It's the Jesus who crashes in your heart. He never grows weary of hearing your prayers. He never grows tired of forgiving you. He never grows ashamed at dwelling with you and bringing, making your heart his home over and over and over again. It is a God, if he did not faint on the cross for your salvation, will not faint to support you in your each and every need that you have in this life. Jesus is amazing. Not a lazy boy savior, is he at all? Not a napper but a one who lived every moment for our salvation and the one who gives us every eternal moment to hear our prayers and to be our Savior and to renew our strength. Just as the people walked out of Jesus or that house in Capernaum, one group going in moaning and the other group mounted up on wings like eagles, so it'll be for you and I too one day when the great unveiling comes. Amen.